I am on the phone with Anne from PP Podcast. And this is the next in our series of discussions comparing the English and Japanese ending themes of the Pokemon movies. This time we're covering Movie 7, Destiny Deoxys, which is a little, little different than the previous movies in certain ways. But uh, as far as the Japanese side, the ending song is Lovely Boy by Tommy February 6th. And then the English side, we have This Side of Paradise by Bree Sharp. I think we're going to have some interesting people to talk about in this one, as well as some interesting, very divergent songs. But uh, as we start on the Japanese side, Anne, what can you tell us about Tommy February 6th? Okay, Tommy February 6th. Uh, her real name is Kawase Tomoko, um, and she wrote the lyrics. Um, and the music and production was done by Malibu Converter, Malibu Convertible and Death Star Records, who she was with at the time, uh, which eventually became part of Sony Music. But they're not important she is the interesting story today. <laughs> uh, her nickname is Tommy, and she was the lead vocalist for a band called The Brilliant Green, uh, which is sort of a pop rock band, sort of a Western rock feel. And her professional name with them was Kawase Tomoko, and still is, even though she's changed it to Okuda Tomoko now, because she married the bassist uh, back in 2003. And she did a lot of work with the Brilliant Green, but also had a few little solo projects on the side. So when they went on a hiatus, she like just went full on into that. She started with Tommy February 6th, which February 6th is her birthday, uh, if you were wondering about that. Uh, and she wanted to do kind of more synth pop with that and like kind of created a, a character of Tommy February who looked really cute but wasn't actually like on the inside it, it's sort of a kind of a weird and awkward juxtaposition uh, and maybe she's repressing some darkness <laughs> like it, it's the sort of image that inspired like Caddy Pamu Pamu and like a lot of young idols and I think Charlie XEX uh has listed her as an inspiration as well that kind of really cute image and cute production and upbeat cute girly songs, but that's not necessarily the visual image that you're getting from this person. And then with Tommy February, she also released under a different solo name, Tommy Heavenly Six, which is like pure alternative rock and kind of just all her songs that didn't fit the image of the Tommy February character. It, it's She's said in interviews, it's like Tommy Heavenly Six is Tommy February Six Dark Side, and you could even call it satire on modern culture. Some of her videos that that just kind of she's really into fashion to a point where it almost becomes parody. And she also created a, another identity, a group called the Tommy Angels, but they only released one single. But she released under both Tommy February Six and Tommy Heavenly Six for quite some time, and then. Around 2007, she slowed down a bit because Brilliant Green came off their hiatus, the band. So then she just went on all three identities and is still active in the music scene today. She's not as prolific as she once was because she's kind of managing three artistic directions. Like the band used to put out an album every year. Now it's more like every four years and... Tomoko's last EP was in 2015 with Tommy's Halloween Fairy Tale, but she's not exactly absent from the music scene, even if she's not releasing as frequently. She's also taken on some producing jobs, so she, she's just done a lot of things. She's somebody who decided she wanted to work and made that work happen. <laughs> yeah, having that sort of alter ego side to it is makes her an interesting character, I suppose. I don't want to judge her too much, but um, it sort of compares to certain, I, I suppose, I'm, I'm thinking for some reason of Cher, but maybe that's not the right example in the English music scene. But there is yeah. a certain, in terms of having a somewhat different personality, depending on the circumstances, it, it kind of feels maybe like that a little bit. Obviously, it's still very different being from a different country and all that, but that just was what sprung to mind, to be honest. Yeah, like I've think I've thought of a lot of groups in the past that I've followed who kind of have a stage persona and then like not a stage persona. That is something that is kind of fading away with the internet generation um, of performers. I would say that they're more the same in both. Do you have any idea how this song got attached to this movie? Um, 
I think it's kind of in that same vein of like, she was approached by the Pokemon company to do a tie-in song. I would say, based on the lyrics, it sounds like she was very cognizant of the theme of the movie, of movie seven and what they were going for. Or at least she incorporated it more so than some of the previous artists we've talked about. Like her song lyrically actually ties in surprisingly well to the themes of the movie, which which you kind of wouldn't get from the first listen. But we've talked about how some of the other artists who have been outsourced to do the tie-in song for the movie score don't always seem to have have a real connection, a strong connection to the events of the movie. Yeah, I read through a translation, and we'll get to the lyrics in a little bit, but there are some connections, at least from what I saw. But uh, for now, let's go back to the English side, this side of Paradise. It is performed by Bree Sharp, and she also co-wrote it with John Siegler. Uh, John Siegler uh, has worked on many Pokemon songs over the years, and we'll be talking a lot about him in the uh, the next episode for Movie 8, because he does that ending theme. But um, as far as Bree herself, um, she's had kind of an interesting career. Now, it was a little hard for me to figure out what the chronology of everything is. She has a website. I dug through there and found some things, including that does mention her work on Destiny Deoxys. Um, but she's done voiceover work. She's done a little bit of acting. She's done music, of course. As far as her, like, mainstream musical work, she's probably best known for a song called David Duchovny, which I guess means she must be a pretty big fan of the X-Files. There are a number of them out there, of course. But um, I've never actually, to be honest, listened to that song, so I don't know exactly what it revolves around. Um, We can take a guess. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the show or just the actor in general. I should I should really I should really have bothered to listen to that I suppose. Oh well, but in any case, she's done uh, s- some other musical work. Uh, she did a number of songs for the I guess the dub of Mew Mew Power. She did a couple songs there. Uh, did some voice acting. She's done voiceover work for a number of commercials. I think we found uh, ones for Revlon and Oil Olay. And like Holiday Inn, uh, University of Phoenix. So, done a lot of voiceover work in commercials, which may explain how she got involved in this project because uh, the the Pokemon, uh, you know, John Leffler and uh, some of the, his associates were well uh, involved in the commercial uh, advertising space voiceover work, and so that may be where they ran into each other one way or another. By the way, this song used to be available commercially. Um, it was part of a big collection of four kids songs where there were like three songs per track that were released back in like, I think, early 2005, not long after this movie. Uh, sadly, they are yet another victim of the 2009 iTunes DRM purge. But I did kind of want to mention that. So at one point it was possible to get this song outside of this context, but uh, now you kind of just got to watch the movie and listen to it. Based on the people involved, I have to assume this was written at least partially for this movie, um, but I don't have any too much solid information on how things came together or anything like that, so I'm afraid I can't offer much more insight than that. So we've discussed what we know about the sort of background of these songs. Let's talk about, first of all, how they sound. So on the Japanese side, Lovely Boy, it has a very 80s feel, to be quite honest, to it, uh, which, as I understand, is actually fairly typical for Tommy February's work. Uh, and do you want to go into that? I would say that's accurate, yeah. Like, her work with the Brilliant Green, it, as I mentioned, it's kind of Western rock, and they are heavily inspired by, like, the Beatles and music from the 60s. So she always has a bit of a vintage quality to all of her songs. And then specifically with her February 6th stuff, um, yeah, she's going for, like, a synth pop vibe and she started in like 2000 or no well she started with the band in 95 so the 80s would not have been that far behind and the musical aesthetic from japan especially that flavor of sounds would not have been like so out of place for her to draw from so yeah i definitely think you're on point with (laughs) that assessment yeah, I, I do like this song, um, but I did kind of want to be honest here for just a second. Maybe it's the drum beats at the beginning, but 
Even though this song came out in Japan in 2004 before YouTube, this song kind of has a certain Rickroll quality to it. It's, <laughs> I kind of like to jokingly refer to it as Japan's answer to the Rickroll. And that's not to say it's a terrible song or anything, but it is, to me, stylistically one of those songs you can sort of spring on someone as in sort of a similar fashion to Never Gonna Give You Up. You can start that. We can make a, we can make a new trend, a new meme. But, uh, yeah, so the, the instrumentation, like I said, kind of lends itself to that. It's got that, that, that very poppy vibe. What about the lyrics itself? Uh, what is the song? Obviously, there is a lot, quite a bit of English in there interspersed throughout things. But uh, what does the song say as a whole? Well, well, first of all, I'm going to just say I know she was not a character yet, but this is Serena's anthem right here. Basically, the song is a boy always looking at only his dreams and not paying attention to anything else. And there's this girl on the sidelines kind of trying to make a connection with him, trying to get his attention and kind of that bittersweet feeling of he won't notice me the way I want. But coupled with just being with him and being friends is a connection that makes her happy. And maybe the thing she loves most about him is those distant eyes that are always looking towards his dream. And in the song, I think ultimately she'd rather see where that dream leads. She'd rather go with him to that dream than break what they have to be like petulant to get him to look at her right now. Like, at first listen, I wouldn't have thought this had anything to do with the movie. But, you know, in digging through the lyrics and looking through those thoughts of, you know, how being with him and that connection to him, you know, brings her joy, despite the fact that reality is not quite what she wants it to be right now, that she has this this friendship, that ties in perfectly to the theme of the movie, which the director has stated is connections, the connections between humans and Pokemon, Pokemon and Pokemon, and humans and other humans. And this song is explicitly about a relationship between two people that is imperfect, but is precious to her and how she navigates that connection with him. So I was a little surprised. It actually seems to fit kind of well for Ash and Tori and Tori and Deoxys and the two separated Deoxys. Like none of those people are in a, a loving relationship or aspiring to be loving, but they are in... Those are the connections that the movie draws from of not connecting to people, but being able to find a place where you can be happy and enjoy the relationship you do have. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something you would not get if you're like me and you really only know, uh, you don't really know much Japanese because the, uh, the, the words are actually in English seem very poppy and, and seems to suggest the song is, to be honest, kind of frivolous. Yeah, it's because of those English lyrics, like, even I think if you do speak Japanese, or or if you're like me, where you're like at a medium level, that took some thinking to try to move things in the order they needed to be so that the sentence made sense. Because obviously, the structure of Japanese grammar is different. So the parts where she's speaking English are then followed by a Japanese phrase. But when you translate it back around, it's so like, you had to think about it. But once you did, it was like, oh, there, there's actually some some meaning here. <laughs> Interesting. I may have to read through a translation again to get a little more of it. I, the translation I did, I think, mentioned some. I kind of locked on. There's some mention of like like a shooting star or something like that, which is sort of featured. I mean, that's sort of what the there's a meteorite that that's in the movie, different from the one in the previous movie or, or something like that. Is, isn't that right? Yeah. And I have to say, kudos to her for using Lame, like the fabric, as a song lyric. Like, I've never heard that before in my life. <laughs> but. And there's also a reference to like a bridge, and there must, there, well, that LaRue City is on an island, so it's more or less, there, there must be bridges there, but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it just seems very much like they told her the theme of the movie very early on while she was developing the song. And again, I'm sure they did that for all the um, artists that they contracted out of house, but it, it does seem that either she went with the theme a little bit more aggressively or that this movie has a very solidly defined theme and story concept. 
So it sounds like you have to dig a little bit and read into things a little bit, but the lyrics do match up with the movie, at least on a certain level. I would think so, yes. Keep listening for more from this interview. <laughs> 